and uh, her brother started a church in, in Jacksonville, so they felt called to go down there and, and help him. And uh, Steve has stage four brain cancer, and uh, he's been dealing with that for, I don't know, it seems like last fall. And so I talked to him yesterday and yesterday morning. It sounded great. Uh, Tanya called me at, I can't remember if it was five or seven this morning. They were back in the ER. Um, she thought he'd had a stroke. Uh, so I talked to her a while ago. Um, he, he, he had a seizure. He has a hole in his colon. And uh, it, it's not a, there's not any infection that they know of at this time. It's just air. But uh, his brain, his, uh, the tumor in his brain is swelling again. And so um, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of time. And so uh, he slept most of the day, uh, on pain medication. Uh, fortunately, they, you know, last week when he was in there, they were having a hard time finding something that would give him some relief from the pain. And so, um, y'all just, y'all just remember that it's a, you know, they got great attitudes, but it's still what it is. And um, there's just a whole bunch of people dealing with stuff, but that's uh, that's the most urgent one at the moment. So, um, y'all pray for Steve and Tanya. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight. Lord, it's a great week. It's a, it's a week that uh, the most important time of the year for believers, uh, at least that's what I think and what I believe. <clears throat> Lord, as we we look at the uh, the Passion Week and what's what's going on the week, you know, after Palm Sunday, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, what, what's going on? And there's a lot of things happening, a lot of evil things that are happening. But, Lord, the, 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 the most wonderful thing is that we see your plan unfold and, and, and uh, uh, that's what that's what we we base base our beliefs on our faith on is the resurrection and the, the fact that your plan is eternal and when we know you we can we know that uh, when we uh, when we receive you and we're baptized we, we're baptized into your death and raised just like you're resurrected and so uh, we pray for uh, members of our family that uh, that don't know you that continue to reject you that's what's going on in the world right now and that's prophesied and that's what we're talking about in revelation. Uh, so, Lord, we, we should have a burden for for that, uh, for just sharing the gospel, planting the seed. That, we're just farmers is what we are. So, Lord, just uh, just pray we'd be with us now as we talk about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday leading up to Good Friday and what, what all that is. So, uh, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for those that are here tonight. Uh, we just love you and thank you for loving us like you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so I've looked at uh, a lot of stuff this week. Every year I... Let's talk, y'all just have to forgive me because my nose is like a sieve. I um, apologize for that, but um, every year I just, I begin looking at the resurrection months in advance, just uh, thinking about it, reading about it, and, and so here, here's what I thought about. How many of us know people that show up on Easter Sunday, and that might be the only time of the year they go to church, uh, or maybe Christmas? Um, one of the pastors, I was talking to him about it the other day, and he said, you know, he said, you know, we, we understand what CEOs are, but so this is this is just the one without, without the O. It's just about uh, C and E. Uh, that, that's what we got. That's what we deal with. How many times? How many times do have they heard this story? That, that's just really been in my, my mind. And uh, I mean, I sat there for a long time. I heard it a, a long time. What can we do about that? We just continue to teach and preach the word. That, that's what we do. Continue to love. Um, some, sometimes our family members, our friends are just hard to love. But that's what Jesus did for us. He, he, we love people. Uh, in spite of what they say, how they act, what they do, we need to hold them accountable, certainly. But, but uh, uh, we've got to do that in love, even love, even some of the stupid things that people do. Um, Jesus loved them, and and uh, uh, and that, that's what we're going to do. So let, let's just talk about, we talked about Palm Sunday and what happened there uh, on, on Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry, Jesus comes, he comes into Jerusalem, he's riding the donkey colt. Uh, we talked about that. But these are these are, these are the days leading up to the crucifixion of Christ, and, and, and Easter is, is just, it's the most vital, uh, important thing in, in our lives. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection. Uh, it's about, about our faith, the gospel. And so 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2 says, Paul says, Now 
I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you. I want to make that clear to you. It's simple. It's a simple thing. He says, the, which you have received. So he's talking to the Corinthian church on which you have taken your stand. You've received it and you have taken your stand on the gospel. <clears throat> and verse 2 says, and by which you're being saved. So a lot of people say, what does that mean, being saved? We're saved. Yeah, we're being saved, but we're, we're being saved every day. You know, that's that sanctification process that we, where we grow and we, we keep growing until he calls us home. We grow. He said, if, if you hold to the message I preach to you, the, 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 the new covenant, the, 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 the cross, the blood, the resurrection, if you hold on to that message that I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Uh, Monday night, uh, I, I told the guys in Monday night Bible study, we were talking about Revelation, I mean, uh, Matthew 25, the second chapter of the Olivet Discourse. George W. Truett, uh, Truett Seminary at Baylor University, it's named after him, preached thousands of, sem of, of sermons, baptized over a thousand, I don't know how many people. And when he was laying on his deathbed, they asked him, said, George, why are you, Dr. Truett, why are you crying? He was weeping, and he said, because most of the people that I baptize, I will not see in heaven. Now, think about that. That, 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 that should bring tears to our heart. And, and I, I, I know that I've baptized some, and you never see any change in their life, and uh, uh, there are men that I, I talk to. I don't, I don't want a mentor. I don't need a mentor. Well, bull hockey, you do. All of us, every one of us, men and women, we need mentors. And the Bible says that the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. Um, but that's, that's sad. Unless you have believed in vain. Every one of us need to be reminded regularly of the importance of Easter. Uh, in... in, in uh, in verse 3, it says, Paul says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also re received. Now think about that. Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus. He blinded Paul. Paul, Saul, had persecuted Christians, uh, killed Christians, uh, children, women. He, he did not discriminate. And he says... I passed on to you as most important what I also received. What he tells us there is that the salvation that Paul received is no different than the salvation that we received. It was the same then as it is today for anybody. He said that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to the truth. That's, that's what the word says. So I hope Sunday that everybody would seek out somebody that you know has believed in vain or doesn't know Christ, and bring them. Just invite them. Just invite them to come. I pray that, that, that we'll have a house full. We generally always do and on Easter Sunday. But um, think about that. Pray about that. Holy Week, Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And so as we celebrate Easter, we, we should all be filled with joy. We, we need to understand the cost, the cost, Paul said, or Luke said, in uh, what is that, 923, he said, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow him. Deny himself. Hard. It's hard. That's what, that, that's what he teaches us. We, we, we need to understand the cost and we need to understand the sacrifice, the great sacrifice that he made. Anybody, anybody here see uh, uh, The Passion of the Christ that, that movie, how hard was that to watch? When you read and study about how Jesus suffered uh, the stump, when he was leaned over the stump uh, and, and they, they beat him, they, they, those Roman soldiers were expert executioners. And they had the cat of nine tails, those long strips of leather with pieces of bone and steel tied at the end as they whipped him. 
with those 39 lashes, every time it would grab his skin and rip that piece, those pieces of skin off. Think about that. And a normal that would that 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 when you read about that and study that, you you know that he was a supernatural God, because only only God could withstand that. The cost, the sacrifice. So let's look at the eight days of Easter Real quickly. We we can go over to, to Palm Sunday, and in Matthew twenty one. I got a lot of scriptures. You may just want to write the scriptures down, and I'll read some of them. Some of them I'll just talk about. But Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11, talks about Palm Sunday. In Matthew 20, 21, verse 4, it says, This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. All this is prophesied in the Old Testament. The scriptures back it up. <clears throat> and so uh, Matthew explains that Jesus' entire life and his ministry. They were marked by two <laughs> two, two uh, events. Number one, to do his father will, father's will, and number two, to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies of his first coming, the, the, the advent, and and so the time when he came to earth as, as a child, the incarnation. And so, one very interesting thing that, that occurred to me is as I was reading this, uh, when he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey colt, it was the first time that he had been in Jerusalem. The first time he had shown his face in Jerusalem since. He raised Lazarus from the dead. That I, I, I read that and read that, but that, that really sh- struck me as, as important. Uh, the people, lots of people, the vast multitude, uh, they, they had made Jesus into someone that he was not. They would made him into some sort of a celebrity. He was not a celebrity, but they were looking for, remember what we talked about Sunday, they were looking for that warrior king to come and, and release them from the oppression of the Romans. They were so oppressive. Uh, if, so I'll pause every once in a while because when I think about what's going on back then, I'm thinking about some of the things we're experiencing today or seeing today. But they made him into somewhat of a celebrity, but they, again, they were looking for this, this warrior king. They had seen Jesus uh, perform these miracles. They had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They had seen him give sight to the blind man. They had seen him heal the guy that his friends lowered down through the roof of the the, the house to, uh, to to get him in front of Jesus. They wanted him to be the king. They wanted him to be that 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 great king that was going to release them from the oppression of the Romans. But they didn't understand that Jesus had come to Jerusalem for the, a reason that they didn't they didn't understand. So that's kind of a but God moment. But but God, uh, God sent Jesus to Earth for something much greater than to be some local king, some local ruler. So that's basically Palm Sunday. Let's look at Holy Monday, Matthew 24. Um, In Matthew 24, verses 45 to 48, I want to read that. It says, talking about faithful service to Christ. It says, who then, this is Jesus, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Blessed is the one when he comes who is servant, who has that servant's heart, who's, who's, who's the people that he's serving are much more important than, than him, himself. That, that we, we should be serving people that are in need much more than we, we serve ourselves. He says, truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards. That servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him in an hour he does not know. The delay. He has been delayed for a long time. There's, there's a reason for that. None of us know the day or the hour that he's coming. God only knows. And it's like I said, that song that Amy sang Sunday, it had that verse in there. I don't know if I still have that. I think it's in my other notebook. It said something to the effect, there could come a time when you come sooner sooner than you think that you come face to face with me. The signs, the, the disciples said, what are the signs? And he gave them a list of things, and we're seeing those things all over the world come to fruition. And he said, when those things intensify, my time of coming is near. When is that? These people talking about this April 8th eclipse. 
I told him somebody the other day, I said, y'all better get ready, the rapture's coming that day. I said, now, I'm not prophesying anything, but it's just a, you know, people get married on that day, on eclipse day. You know who? Anyway. Just shows the goofiness of people. Oh, you know, maybe if you're one of them, I'm not trying to offend you or anything, but what's, what, that, that's the whole thing. What do we focus on? All that's neat and, you know, but what do we focus on here? We're supposed to focus on Jesus. So think about this. Holy Monday, it, it is Passover time, and Jerusalem is filled with people. It's like a beehive. And and, and if you ever uh, taken a, uh, seen a beehive or a, a hornet's nest and taken a stick and just whacked that thing, that's kind of what Jerusalem is like. They go everywhere. Uh, and and uh, th- that's kind of like, that's about talking about how how much how many people there are in Jerusalem, shoulder to shoulder. And so that's the day when Jesus, he goes into the temple. He goes in the afternoon and he cleans house. He goes in there and the money changers, this is, this is a misunderstood piece of scripture when Jesus goes in there and cleans out the scripture. You know, a lot of people think that he goes in there and cleans it out because they're just selling stuff in the temple. They're not just selling stuff in the temple, selling goods in the temple. They're selling stuff, but they have jacked up the prices. They have created an inflationary situation there in the temple, and they're they're cheating people. Uh, they they've got scales that they you know they got their foot on, and they're they're overcharging people. That that's what Jesus is upset. They are not being truthful with the masses, and so he goes in there and he cleans house. And he says he calls them the den of thieves. You den of thieves, and he just cleans house. <coughs> so, the temple courts had been turned into something that had, was not intended. And so these guys were buying and selling animals uh, that were to be sacrificed at the temple altar. And so, again, they were just overcharging people far and above what they normally charge. And Jesus, he wasn't having it. He had a, I guess he had what we call righteous anger. I'm not sure I understand what that is because every once in a while I get, you know, I think we all get angry at some things. But who was behind all that? that? That's the question. Who was behind all that? The Pharisees, the, the religious leaders. They're the ones that are behind that. And and Satan had done, he'd done all that through those men who were trying to catch Jesus in, in untruth or uh, trying to get him to contradict what he said and make him out to be a, hypoc- a, a hypocrite. <coughs> Excuse me. These people were cheating. The, uh, these guys were cheating the people in this sacred place, and they had made it filthy and dirty, a dirty thing, which was... Jesus was incensed about that. And so the chief priests and, and the scribes, scribes they, they'd seen, just like the people, they'd seen all these wonderful things, all these miracles that Jesus had done. And, and, and then in, in 2415, I said 2415. <clears throat> I got so many scriptures there, I don't, I don't think that's the right one. Anyway, the, the children, I hate it when I do that. Anyway, the children screamed out Hosanna. They screamed out Hosanna. And, and, and that infuriated the, the Pharisees anymore. And Jesus responded with, with Psalm um, 8, verse 2, by saying this. He said, from the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. Jesus, that's how he responded on on Monday. So we see what's going on on Monday. On Tuesday in Matthew 21, verses, so 21, 23 to 26, 5, there's a whole lot of things that are going on. Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching. It's a busy day. He had spent, he spent Tuesday uh, teaching in the, in the temple, and he had made it clear who he was and who he is. He's the king of the Jews. He's Lord. He's Savior. He's Messiah. He made that clear. But nobody really understood what sort of king, what sort of Lord, what sort of Savior he was. Again, they were looking for this guy to save them. The Pharisees, they are angry. They are some kind of mad. They're doing everything they can do to trap Jesus. And so they ask him a lot of questions. Uh, they interrogate him. They're doing their best to catch him in a lie. And so he's spending the day teaching parables. There's six or seven parables that Jesus is, is, is talking about. So 
just a reminder, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly heavenly meaning. So Jesus Jesus is going about healing people, and and uh, over Matthew twenty two, verses thirty seven to thirty nine, he says he gives this very important command. He says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind." This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it, like love your neighbor as yourself. So he gives us that that great command there. And then in chapter twenty three, Jesus <laughs> he 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 gives them the woes, the seven woes. I mean, he hammers down on them. I preached that sermon at church one day, and after church, this guy came up and was ready to whip my rear. I, and I said, "You feel guilty?" And about that time, he drew back, and I went, "Elders, come here, come to me." I mean, he was he was about he was a bit David side. He was I was looking up, and he started poking me in the chest. I knew I had to get out of there because I don't I don't take that lightly. So I left. But Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He 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 says he says, "Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites!" Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Woe to you, blind guides. Woe to you. He just keeps on and going. He is just hammering the fact that they are hypocrites. And uh, in the last in verse 33, he says, Snakes, brood of vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and pursue town to town. Jesus is not happy. And so if you go back to verses 3 and 4 there, 23, he says, he says, they don't do, he said, don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. And verse 4 says, they tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They're just, it's a control thing. They're just trying to control the people. So, in Luke 20, these guys are still trying to trap him, but in Luke 20, it's the last time they try to trap him. In verses 20 to 26, they, they, they try to trap him about the taxes that, are, that uh, the Romans uh, have imposed on the people. And so, here's what happens. He says in verse 20, he says, Talking about God and Caesar. And, and so the, the scripture says, give to God what is God's, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. We're all, we all have to pay taxes. We're all supposed to follow, obey the law. And so Jesus said, they watched closely and sent spies pretending to be righteous so they could catch him in what he said to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. They questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly and you don't show partiality but teach Truthfully, the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They here they are, they're trying to trap him. In verse 23 he says, But detecting their craftiness, he said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well then, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that that are God. They were so perplexed at the same time, astounded by the wisdom that He gave them. That's the last time they tried to trap Him with one of their, their with their questions or their interrogation. And then in, in Matthew twenty four, we see that Jesus, Jesus secretly goes to his his boys, just He and the boys, and and He predicts uh, He predicts His death in twenty four. So these guys, they don't, they don't have any idea who he is. I mean, they don't know what he's talking about. Uh, they're, they're perplexed as well. And so he spends the rest of the evening teaching his Olivet Discourse, chapter Matthew 24 and 25. That's the Olivet Discourse. And it's the longest uh, sermon that he has. And he talks about the signs, what the signs are, and what, what, uh, what, what people have to look forward to uh, in, in his coming. And so that's the only place in Scripture where, where Jesus shared his thoughts about the end times here in Matthew 24 and 25. So that's Tuesday. On Wednesday in Matthew 26, this is that long stretch of, of, uh, of Scripture. Things seem to be quieted down on Wednesday. 
Why? It says in verse 3 of 26, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest. So all these scoundrels are gathered up. It says, they cons- verse 4 says, They conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. So, yeah, things appear quiet, but these guys are gathered up secretly and they're trying to come up with a plot to murder to murder Jesus. And so Jesus is over in Bethany. He, he's resting. Um, in verse 6 it says, While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head and he was as he was reclining at the table. So so he's, he's in Bethany and, 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 and he's sitting at this table. And so the highlight of Wednesday, Wednesday is this woman that comes and wants to anoint him with this perfume. And in verse 7, again, it says, She approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, and she poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. Now think about that. It's Wednesday. He, he is at Simon's house. He's sitting at a table, and this woman comes up with this alabaster jar, this, this expensive jar of this expensive perfume. 36, probably a Approximately 36 hours before he goes to the cross. And he is sitting there. And in John 12, verses 1 to 8, I'm not going to read all those to you, but he says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Okay, so he's in Bethany. What else is in Bethany? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, his, his good friends. He spent a lot of time in their house with them resting. So if you read the four Gospels, the account of the four Gospels of this woman, only John identifies the woman. It's Mary. It's Mary. Um, It says in verse 4, it says, uh, Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with this fragrance of perfume. And in verse 4, it says, Then one of his disciples, guess who shows up? Judas Iscariot. He's about to betray Jesus. He said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say that because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and was still part of what what was put in it. And Jesus, here's what Jesus said. Leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. She has kept it for the day of my burial. Jesus is telling Judas, hey, and the others, Mary's done this wonderful thing. She is anointing my body for my burial while I am still alive. And later that night, over in Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16, Judas makes arrangements with the Pharisees to betray Jesus. And so he sells his soul to the devil as he makes arrangements with those Pharisees to have Jesus arrested. And for 30 pieces of silver, Judas betrayed Jesus. Over in Zechariah eleven twelve, it talks about 30 pieces of silver. It says, Then I said to them, If it seems right to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. So they weighed my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And we know the story about, about Judas. And then Thursday, Matthew 26, 17 to 75, another long stretch. And so there's some key things that happen in this, this scripture. Uh, there's a bunch of verses there in 26. We see um, the washing of Jesus' feet, the disciple, the washing of the disciples' feet. Jesus washes his feet. We should be washing people's feet, figuratively. If you've seen me on stage do that, uh, as I preached that sermon one time, no matter who they are, no matter what stage of life they're in, no matter what, <laughs> this morning I met with a guy up here at Whataburger, and uh, so when I get my coffee and I walk around, there's, there's two black guys there. One guy's got on a veteran's cap, and so I said, hey, man, thanks for your service. And another guy sitting with me said, what about me? He said, I'm a good guy. I said, you know what? Good guys can go to hell. <laughs> he said, Wow. I said, look, man, hell's full of good guys. 
You know Jesus is your Savior? I do. I said, you're good. You're good. Do you believe that? You believe in the cross? And you know, like this guy said, over there with me with you, like, man, you just blunt. Man, they, they was a, we just created a great conversation right there. When they left, man, they came over and uh, they saw me pray with this guy. And, and uh, it's just that simple. That, that, that's, that's washing people's feet. That's what we're called to do. So, Jesus, we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We see the announcement of the coming betrayal, the Passover meal, <clears throat> the importance of that in the upper room and what's going on there. Peter's denial, the three-time denial, the rooster crows, <clears throat> Jesus' farewell to his men, and, and the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his arrest in the garden. So Jesus is praying, uh, but the real reason he is there is to wait. What is he waiting on? He is waiting. He knows what's coming, and he is ready. He's been waiting for it to happen. He knows it's coming. He's ready to fulfill the promise that he, he had, he had given. And in John 13, verses 19 and 20, 13, 19, it says, this is him speaking. He says, I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. He said, truly, I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives him who sent me. And then going back to Psalm 41, if I can find that tab, I got too many tabs tonight, so I'll just turn over there. Maybe that's it right there. Yep. In 41.9 it says, Even my friend in whom I trusted, this is the Psalm of David, Even my friend in whom I trusted, one who ate my bread has raised his heel against me. That's what he's saying about Judas. I mean, that Jesus is talking about Judas in that manner. Here's one who had lived with Jesus the same time as the other disciples. He had broke bread with him. He shared the Passover meal with him. And he betrayed Jesus. So the question is, was, was Judas ever truly a, a disciple? Probably not. He, uh, just like Mary, when Mary broke the alabaster jar and poured that expensive perfume, he was angry, not because uh, uh, she, he thought she had wasted it. It was because he was a greedy thief. He wanted the money from that. And so in Matthew 26, going back to Matthew uh, chapter 26, in verse 59, says this. Jesus faces the Sanhedrin. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. So later that night, they gathered up, and again, they're, they're, they're plotting his death. After that, there's six illegal trials through the night that they put Jesus through. So Sunday, I'm going to ask you a question. So the crowds are yelling at Jesus and praising him. They don't know who he, they don't know the real who he is. Is that the same crowd that is going to scream for his crucifixion? Think about that. Think about that. So let's uh, let me close with secrets. Um, what is the cost of declaring our faith in Christ? What is the cost? Um, let's think about a guy who is really influential. He was wealthy. He was a respected member of the, the religious establishment, the Sanhedrin. And he knew that if he revealed his true faith, the, what he truly believed, his spiritual loyalty, he would forfeit everything that he had. In Luke 23.50, it says, There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, 
a member of the Sanhedrin who had not agreed with their plan and action. He was from Arimathea. So Joseph of Arimathea, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was wealthy. Uh, he was part of this group of Jewish religious leaders, the ones that had called for the crucifixion of Jesus. And the scripture tells us he was a good and righteous man. But in, in, in verse 51, it says, he had not agreed with their plan and action. Why? He was a secret follower of Jesus. We cannot be secret followers of Jesus. There is a cost. When I came to Christ in 94, I lost some good friends. What's wrong with you, man? Why are you, what are you doing going to Africa? What, what's that about? They don't get it. They, they don't get it. Whether you go to Africa, I talked to, uh, I met a guy yesterday in our Bible study that, show, uh, that came, and he's got a daughter. Um, he's a he's a he's a fishing and hunting guy. He lives in Idaho, fishing and hunting guy, and uh, went to TJC out here and ended up up there. And he goes to colleges and he he shares the gospel. He shares the gospel all over, and and so he was telling us this story, but. Um, um, people are afraid to share their story. Man, I I'm afraid every time I walk. Like when I went to Alaska, I was a, I, 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 Lord, I, I I can't do this. The devil said, I, "You can't do that. You can't go up down that beach and meet these strangers and tell them about me." Every one of us has got a story, and we cannot keep that secret. Joseph of Arimathea knew knew that, and 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 there's a cost. There's a cost. He was afraid for anybody to know of his faith in Christ. That's a serious deal with him. And so we can't keep it a secret. And that that's, people are afraid. And so my question to you, are, are, are you afraid? What, what are you afraid of? Uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, go back here to the Old Testament. Joshua is about to take Moses' place. Moses is old. He said, <clears throat> I am now 120 years old. I can no longer act as your leader. And the Lord has told me, you will not cross the Jordan. In verse 6, he tells Joshua, he says, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. I have to remember that when, when, when you get in a situation. You cannot be afraid. If you are a student of the Bible, if you're involved in a Bible study, when you get in those situations, you just, the Holy Spirit just takes over. The Word says, my Word will not return void. So we just have to go. And that's what Jesus was telling his boys. Peter came around. In John 19 or 20, Jesus asked Peter three times, he said, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you, do you really love me, Peter? Yeah, you know I love you, Lord, but feed my sheep. And then he says the third time, Peter, are you sure you really love me? Now, I'd, I'd really love to know what the inflection of Peter's voice was at that time. Was he hurt because Jesus asked him three times, or was he ticked off like when he cut the guy's ear off in the Garden of Gethsemane? So what do you mean? You know I love you, Lord. Why do you ask me this stuff? Jesus said, Feed my, tend my sheep. We're to tend the sheep. You're the sheep. I'm the shepherd. I'm a sheep. I have men that, that feed into me. We need to be fed into the word and let the word speak in our life. And so that's what that's what Sunday's all about. There will be people here who come once a month, once a year on Easter. They'll come with mom or come with dad or come with mom and dad and they'll come in here and they don't want to be here. How many times have we heard that? We just have to depend and pray that the Holy Spirit would speak life into them. Maybe this is their time. Things happen in God's time, not Mike's time, not your time. So that's the week. And then we have Good Friday. So I'll talk about that Sunday. What, what is Good Friday? What does Good Friday mean? We know uh, that he gets arrested and they take him, put the crown of thorns on his head. And marching up to Golgotha, it's a hard time. 